agree. Okay. So you got, let's see, uh, you're estimating that 2014 it's $8,752. We'll have to wait uh, probably until the beginning of next year to actually see what the value is here. And you can probably find this by going into a database. And what's the source of this information? I believe it was the US, the College Board. So you could check it out through the College Board. And so that seems reasonable, right? So this model appears if we go a little bit outside of 2010. If we go a little bit outside, it seems like it's still working. What happens when I go 10 years in the past? So in this case, X is 14. What's the value of X for 1990? Negative 10, because it's 10. And what did we get? $184. Does that seem plausible? No, unfortunately. So what that means is the model has broken down. It's called model breakdown, OK? It really is called model breakdown. I didn't make that up. And what it means is you've got to be really careful with these models. If you go too far outside your data set, you could run into trouble with your predictions or your estimates. If you work within the data set, let, let's suppose I only gave you the tuition and fees for every even year from 2000 to 2010, and you wanted to, say, find the value for 2007, that's OK. You're within the model. When you go too far outside on either end, you could run into trouble. So you want to keep that in mind later on when we're finding our own models for our, for our own sets of data. OK, so we're going to switch course here a little bit. And we're going to talk about sets. And I think many of you are familiar with this term from previous math class as well. In you, there's no way of predicting a future. Um, what about like in the past? Yeah, if you had, right, yes. More data, the better. Absolutely, yeah. OK. So the question from, this is for later on, the question from Will was, is there any way to prevent model breakdown? That's what I was just answering. My students from uh, my summer class said, hey, you know, we're listening to these videos, and it's great, but we can't hear what the students are asking, so I'm going to try to repeat. So I'm, it's going to, I have to change my habit. It will be hard for me to remember, but I'll try to do it. So a set is just a collection of objects. It could be anything, right? So you're a set. You're, you represent the students in Math 107B. You're a set. You're a finite set because I can list every person in this class. So you're finite. You're countable, OK? Each, each object in the set is called an element. And when you can list a set, it's called the roster method. R-O-S-T-E, uh, not the rooster, but the roster. OK. So if we wanted to say the set of the three stooges, and we wanted to use A to represent that, we say A equals. And every time you represent a set in this class, every time, you have to put those curly braces like this. This is how we represent a set. And each one of these, Larry, Moe, and Curly, is an element of the set, of set A. So at your seats, I want you to write a new set. And I want that set to represent the set of seven dwarfs. Go. First team to come up with it, one point on your next quiz. Ooh, one point on your next quiz. Ooh, that's pretty good. Table two uh, was able to represent. And thank goodness, is it Anna? No, oh. Anna. OK, Anna reminded her to put, because Isabel went up and started writing happy, comma, sleepy, comma. And Anna said, put the braces, or else another team would have gotten a chance. So yes, happy, sleepy, dark, blah, 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 right? Up to, what was the last one? Sneezy. I don't want to write them all out. My first class, unfortunately, could come up with six. They forgot bashful. Bashful was so bashful. Okay. All right. So unfortunately for you, most of the sets we work with in this class, are not. you're not going to be able to list each individual element. So we've got to come up with a way of representing sets, because most of the sets we use talk about are going to be number sets. So we have this new notation. It's called set builder notation. 
And at first it looks like really strange. And so this is just some general um, descriptions of what set builder notation looks like. So it always starts with your curly cues, always starts with those, your braces. Then you have an expression here. And, and for this class, you're just going to be using x or y or some variable. And then you have a straight line, up and down, vertical line. And we read that line such that. When we, so we're going to, if I were reading this right now, I'd say this represents the set, because I see these curly braces, the set of x such that x meets some condition. What condition? I could say x is greater than 2,564. So x, rep, this represents the set of all numbers greater than 2,654. I put some kind of condition there. So if I wanted to be able to use set builder notation to represent the set of negative numbers, this is how it would be done right here. You start off with the curly braces. You say x. This thing is read such that. And then you place your condition after it. The condition now is an inequality. Here it is. Here's your inequality. So to be in this set, you must be a number less than 0. So if I asked you to draw a diagram of that, you'd draw a number line. You'd put the number 0. You'd put an open circle at 0, because to be less than 0, you can't include 0. And then you just you'd put a big fat arrow going to the left. So that represents, these two things represent the same set of numbers. I can't possibly list all of the negative numbers in the whole wide world. So this is how you do it. You talk about it, you describe it in this way. All right? So you'll have some practice in your homework to read and do that. And you'll have lots of practice throughout the course. So the last thing we need to talk about is the idea of unions and intersections, which again, I think you might be familiar with. And I decided to use something a little different that hopefully would help you re to remember what the idea of union and intersection is. And so let's see. Andy, could you read number eight for us? Members of the next Elon Rock band, the Beatles, that performed in Hamburg, Germany, was not the same fab four that arrived in the U.S. in 1964. Let A represent the members of the 1961 Beatles, B represent members of the 1964. Okay, you want to read those sets for us? Um, who? Who wants to read the sets? Anybody? The members of each set? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anybody in here by any chance read the book Outliers? Yes. Yes. And do you remember them talking about the Beatles and the Outliers? And why why were the Beatles so good? Well, the theory in one of the theories he presents in Outliers is that you master something if you spend 10,000 hours doing it. So if any of you are musicians or gymnasts or, I don't know, whatever you might, skiers, if you've put a lot of time into something, you usually master, become masters. And it, the book talks about how many hours in, that this band, the, a, the set A Beatles, spent in Hamburg, Germany, club after club, hour after hour, before it even got to the United States. So that's just a little thing on the side. Anyway, it's a great book if you want to read it. If you're really into hockey, you want to read at least the first chapter of the book. All right. Yes, he wrote Tipping Point as well. Yep. OK. So sometimes I like to use these little mnemonics to try to help you remember stuff. So when I was thinking about this uh, two Augusts ago, I was walking up a road on Prince Edward Island, and I'm think I had just written the first few pages of these lecture notes, and I'm like, I don't really want to do union and intersections with just boring old numbers. What could I do? So I thought about the Beatles, and I thought about a Beatle reunion if everybody was still alive. So if we want to imagine a Beatle reunion, and we were going to list the members of the Beatles, in both the 1961 Beatles and the 1964 Beatles, that would come to this reunion. Notice reunion union. 
how would I list the members of that? Well, let's use initials now. How would I list the members members that would come to that reunion as a set? How would I start? Curly braces, yeah. JL, I heard. Go right around each table. Someone from table one? PM. Table three right here? GH, was that table three? Table three? That's all right. Table three. Hannah, how about you, Hannah? SS, okay. Table four? PB. Any more? Table five? RS. Are we done? Okay. So that was pretty intuitive for you, wasn't it? There was no mathematical definition of this. You understood what a reunion would be. Did you want to list John Lennon twice or Paul McCartney twice or George Harrison twice? No, you just said, hey, who's going to be there? John Lennon. He represents himself. He, happen he happens to be in both sets, but I only have to put him in once. You're just asking for each of the different elements in those two sets, and you just put them together. That's the idea of union. So the symbol for union is this U symbol, but notice it doesn't have a stem on it. I see a lot of students do this. That stem is not part of the union symbol. I mean, I'm, I'd never mark you off for that. It's just like a little picky math thing, OK? All right. Now, D is going to be made up of the members in both bands. So how would we make that up? Who, who is in both bands? Someone who maybe hasn't, I haven't called on Tom. How about John Lennon, JL? OK. Now I got you, Katie. How, Sean, how about someone that's in both bands? PM, OK. You can space. It's fine. Just say I'm space and pass. Isabel? GH, anybody else? No, that's it. There were only three members that were in both. That's the elements that they have in common. That's where they would intersect or overlap if you were looking at circles. Like if this represented band A and this represented band B, then J, L, P, M, and G, H would be in the intersection of those two sets. Sets are often represented with these circles. All right. So. That's sets, intersection, and unions. Now, we started the class with this little thing called absolute value. And here is the official definition. OK, but before we do this, I want to show you something about the homework. Notice, before I even tell you to do my math lab class two here, I got a lot of stuff here. It says. Prior to class three, which is Monday, it's important for you to review and work through examples of factoring in your prerequisite section P5. Please read and take notes as needed on P5. You should be familiar with this. Please review the table, a strategy for factoring, on page 72. And then, before you show up on Monday, complete the warm up activity at the beginning of class three, which is the very next page. Here's the beginning of class three. I want you to work through these exercises before you come to class. Okay? So even if you don't touch a stitch of class two on my math lab for Monday, please do this. Or else Monday's class, you're going to be like, what? Factoring? If, if you like totally ignore it, you're going to be a little bit lost, OK? So I want you to take the time to review this factoring and try some of those warm-up activities. Ryan? Yep. So you have oh, yeah, the My Math Lab. You just go into. No, there's no problems from the book. It's just these things for the warm-up I want you. Yeah, right. As needed, I said. So like some people, they've just had factoring recently, like last semester in 096. They might have to take a look at their notes or like look in the book. Some of you haven't looked at math for four years. So you have to like do a little more work, you know? And so everybody's gonna everybody's in a different place, and I, I'm just trying to let you I, 
give you a little like heads up as to what we'll be doing on Monday so you can get yourself prepared. So nothing should be going away. We are not done. Yeah? So you just want us to do A through J. Yeah. Okay. As needed, your reading to so you can do those, All okay? Right. All right. What? Yeah, Isabella. Yep. You get three tries and then they give you a new example. But you can do it as often as you want to. Yes. Nope, nothing comes off. You can try it over and 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 over again. It's an infinite set. Yep. Yep. No. After. Yep. Some people um, in my online class, they only had orientation this week, and some of them have already gone through the first three homeworks because, you know, it's recent to them. Other people have to do it class by class because it's new. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this definition for a minute. A lot of people have trouble with this definition. So you take a look at it and see if you can make heads or tails from it, and we'll have about three or four minutes to talk about it. So just look it over, see if you can make, and look at the question that I'm asking you. Does this definition really say the absolute value can be negative sometime? It looks like it does. What is it really saying? Okay. So just take a look at it, talk about it with your table mates if you need to, see if you can figure out what the heck this says. So anybody want to tackle this? Does this say that the absolute value of x is negative? Is that what it's telling me? No, I hear. No, but I don't know. Is anybody like, no way, Kavanaugh, and this is why? Anybody feeling really confident? Kind of. All right, give it a shot. I feel like it's saying that the number will be divided on the first line, but the number will be represented as positive value, and then it's going to be added to the first line. Okay, I think I got it. So. I think I got it. Anybody else want to give it a try? I'm just curious how you think about this. Really, I, I'm really curious. Anybody? Go ahead, Katie. With these things being applied to it. So, but here's the part that people get really mixed up with, Katie. They look at this and they say, wait a minute, you're telling me the absolute value of x is equal to a negative number. And I know that can't be true. So why are you telling me this is the definition? And people are like all confused. They see that dash x and they say, you're, you're like messing with my brain here. You're telling me that's negative. Oh. What kind of number is x? Where does x live? Yeah, x comes from this set of numbers. It's less than zero. So if this is two separate statements, later on you're going to learn this as a piecewise function. This is two statements thrown into one. It says, if you come from here, if your identity is a non-negative number, so hide this, if you come from this number set, when you're inside, you come out looking exactly the same. You went in being zero or positive, you come out looking exactly the same. Then you cover up that statement, and then what are you? You're a negative number when you come in here. And now some plastic surgery has performed a whole attitudinal change, and then you didn't come out looking like you did when you went in. You came out the opposite of when you, how you went in, and you went in as negative. What's the opposite of any negative quantity? Positive. See you on Monday.